All right, we are in the Torah portion Tzav, which means command. And I don't know if you've had a, a chance to listen to last night's recording. So just in case you haven't, uh, we're going to review a couple of things. So let me try to share for just a second. Okay, here's, here's kind of our thing. What we found last night was that in the cantillation marks of the Torah, and the cantillation marks tell you how to cant or how to sing the song of the Torah because the entire... Don't do that. Just lay down. You don't have to dig a hole. It's okay. Uh, in the Torah portion in Leviticus 8.23, we saw an example of a certain cantillation mark that's found only four times in the Torah. And the cantillation mark tells you basically the notes that you sing, and it tells you how to sustain it um, or how to go up and down, um, like, how fast I'm not a obviously not a music major so there's actual words I should be using that I'm not <laughs> um, I should have consulted my in-laws on this but um, that's the the idea is when you're reading the Torah it's to be sung not read and so you need marks that were added um, at some point in history to tell us there's a chance that these notes could be lost. And so just like they eventually put vowels into the manuscripts to tell us how to pronounce them, because if you don't pronounce them correctly, like we saw in the book of Esther, um, you, could, um, you could come up with a completely different meaning to a sentence because it might have a pronominal ending that's referring to someone, or it might be a proper noun. But in either case, if we vowel it wrong, if we pronounce it wrong, then we've cre created a brand new meaning that's completely dissociated with the meaning of the verse. So we want to be careful. And at some point in history, instead of just recording the letters themselves, they began to put the vowelization so that there would be no errors in the reading of the text. They also added the cantillation marks, which tells you how to sing the text. And when you sing the text, it gives an opportunity for another level of understanding. And we found that last night in the Torah portion, there's a cantillation mark that is really strange and that you have to sustain that and repeat those notes. You have to do that, that progression of notes three times. And so it drags out the word just impossibly long for the average person with no musical training to even be able to do. You can do it with practice, but if you're not a musician, if you're not a singer or a vocalist, it's really hard. And so when you have something like that that's kind of out of the ordinary, we applied the rule of first mention and we went back to the very first time that that particular cantillation mark was used. And what we found is that it was used first in Genesis 19.16. And if you want to glance back there, if you remember the story, the angels have been sent to deliver Lot and his family from Sodom. And they have a very good reason I mean, Lot knows who these angels are. He knows their power. Nevertheless, it says, but Lot lingered. He hung around. And when you hear that word ma in Hebrew, it means what? What? Why? How? <laughs> it's like a little kid, you know, why? 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 And so here we have 
Lot who is lingering, Vayitmama, and that's the first time we see this uh, no, this cantillation mark, which is called the Shoshalet. Shoshalet. Um, and that gives us a clue as to what might be happening when we see that Shoshalet, the cantillation mark, two more times in Genesis, and then one time in our Torah portion in Leviticus. It'll happen four times. So um, we started that process last night of kind of decoding what's going on in the context of those particular instances and then bringing it back to our Torah portion where it says, it's speaking of Moses in 8.23 and it says, and he slaughtered it which is the ram of consecration for Aaron and his sons, for the priesthood. And that particular word there also has the shashalet. What is it telling us? For some reason, Moses was hesitating. There was some pause in his behavior. Something was going on with Moses at that moment that we're going to be able to associate with lot lingering, before he leaves with the angels, um, with Joseph's response to Potiphar's wife when she's tempting him. Um, and so we want to bring it back and say, what do all these contexts have in common that if we were listening to the song, if we were sitting in a synagogue and we understood the Hebrew and we actually heard this Torah portion sung as the song that it is, what would we take away from what's happening with Moses? And in the same way, we would hear what was happening with Lot. And I'll, I won't play that one for you. I'll play it in the context of Moses' hesitation. Because I want you to hear how long and the repetition of those notes. So that's the thing. The Torah can be a song of deliverance, but it can also record songs of ambivalence. What's ambivalence? It's when you can't make up your mind. It's when you're torn. When you want to do something, but there's something inside of you that, that causes you to procrastinate. And so it's like the, the word ambidextrous. When you're ambidextrous, it means you can use both hands equally well. You're not right-handed or left-handed. You're both-handed. So with ambivalence, that's what you're experiencing. It's like, I'm trying to weigh this out because I can see two options here. Um, I see two courses of action. I see two explanations. And so I'm hesitating because one is not stronger than the other at this, you know, short moment in time. I'm ambivalent. Um, I was telling last night's class, I, I couldn't really say before I went, but my husband and I were at Mar-a-Lago last weekend for a pro-Israel event, and I know that's Trump's home, and I am ambivalent about politics. I'm ambivalent about politics because I know that people can become completely consumed with politics, and it, it takes the time and the place of their prayer and their worship and their Torah study. So the the power given to politics is excessive. But like someone pointed out in the after-class discussion, like in the book of Esther, politics can actually come in handy if you know how to work the system. And you need to be able to, like Queen Esther, say, I object. And so we have a political system where it's possible to object. And we need to do more objecting because there's a lot of things going on in our Congress that need to be objected to because they don't represent us whatsoever. And when you don't say anything, the assumption is you don't have an opinion. You don't care. Fine, do whatever you want to do. But no, in the Torah, if you want to object to something, you have to speak up as soon as you hear about it. You have to voice some sort of objection. Now, how we do that, we have to be judicious. I don't think you need to spend all day on Twitter or Twitter or whatever it's called. I don't think you need to spend all day on Facebook forwarding political emails. That's why I am ambivalent about politics. I can see how it's a privilege for us to have a republic, 
but I also see how it can divert attention away from the true king of my republic. <laughs> and my republic's not really a republic, it's a monarchy. I live in a kingdom. So I don't want to confuse living in a physical republic with living in a spiritual kingdom. And I have to manage those things. So I'm, I'm ambivalent. I can see the usefulness here. I can see the usefulness there. Um, of course, but my allegiance is going to be to the kingdom. And the only way I know how to be a good citizen of the kingdom is to remain in the word and not to study politics um, more than I study the word because the word is going to prepare me for eternal citizenship, whereas being involved in politics will only involve me in a worldly citizenship. So we have to be in the world without being of the world. So what do we have with the Shashalet? We have a moment of ambivalence for somebody, uh, I know I need to go this direction, but I also feel a pull in this direction. And again, the pattern here, when we're talking about ambivalence, we know it's a two-step process. When you're going to receive information from the Holy One, from His Word, there's a calling first, vaikra, which is a, a calling of endearment, and then there's the delivery of the message in some way. Now, in this sort of portion, we have a speaking and then a commanding, so a sense of urgency is infused. We have this nice calling, this sweet little term of endearment with the opening book, but now in this second portion of the book, we have now, do it now. You don't have time to wait. I've instructed you, I've told you what to do, I've told you how to do it, and do it. Do it now. Move. And that's what he asks you to do when you know what to do and you know how to do it. And so that's why it seems like we're reading a recap. We already know what to do. We already know how to do it. And so now this is recording the process of now being able to finally, quickly obey the command. Because the longer you delay obeying the command, the more it becomes chametz. What do we mean? It's the play on words he's provided us. The matzot that you're supposed to eat in haste before it becomes leavened, it's spelled exactly the same as mitzvot, commandments. So what happens when you delay doing a command that you know what to do and you know how to do it? Then the commandment begins to become chametz. When you procrastinate in doing a commandment that you know what to do and how to do it, you're increasing the odds that something will happen or some things will happen, circumstances will change that will prevent you from keeping the commandment. The, the longer you leave the mess, the less chance you're going to clean up the mess, right? Because then it piles up and you become less and less inclined to tackle this growing pile. So if you were to, say, clean up after yourself in the kitchen quickly, you don't have to three days later look and see that you've piled every dish and piece of silverware in the kitchen on the counter and it's dirty. And the longer it sits there, the less inclined you're going to be to clean that up because then it's too big. I've gone in before and helped someone who, um, she wasn't exactly a hoarder, but she didn't clean up. We spent all day doing laundry for her. We spent all day cleaning the kitchen for her. And I cannot describe to you what was in that kitchen. We can't describe to you how old the laundry was. And I don't know if they were just buying new clothes rather than do laundry. But see, the longer it went, the less inclined she was to start the job. And so, you know, it was somebody from our church years ago, but it, it made an impact on me. Like the longer I let things go in the spiritual realm, the less inclined I'm going to be to go back and clean up after myself. 
in terms of repentance and changing my direction because I lost that opportunity. I lost that window we've been talking about. So we want to do it quickly. And so we fulfill. And then only later do we see why we did it. First we do, and then we hear. That's the pattern. And it's layered so that it goes in successive cycles, even with the same commandment. Don't expect to understand everything when you do a commandment today, don't expect that you'll perform it perfectly the first time when you do it, nor should you expect that even within your lifetime, you'll understand the depth of why. Will you ever see the, the bottom of that commandment? Because the spiritual aspect of it is concealed from your eyes, just like the lower garden. And because of faith, you do with a limited understanding that what I'm doing right now, just on the other side of that veil, something is happening. Because I did that commandment, something is happening in a spiritual realm that I can't see with my physical eyes, and that's why they call it faith. So we can't expect that we can ever explain to somebody why we do a commandment in its entirety. We can give a simple explanation we can give an explanation based on where we are right now in our walk. This is what I understand about the commandment right now and why it's important. But understand, I will not, until I cross into that kingdom, experience the depths of understanding. Part of that is concealed because Paul writes to the Romans, the commandment is spiritual. We're engaging it at the physical level. Why? In faith, that there is a spiritual aspect, just like us. We have a physical aspect and we have a spiritual aspect. It's only in the physical realm that we can express that which is spiritual inside of us. So when we keep the, the physical commandment, it's because that first causes the spiritual just on the other side of the kingdom. And we're living basically in two realms. The problem is we can't see that other realm we're really living in already. The commandment, the tzitzit that go on, your, on the fringes of your garment, those are understood to be the chains that um, connect you to the heavenlies. And they represent the commandments. You look at them and you say, I need to do the commandment. Why? The commandment is what is connecting you with that other side that you can't see, but you're operating on the understanding that it's there. Just like the resurrection. Abraham operated on the understanding. Resurrection was there, even though he hadn't seen it. And that's what we're doing. So when you keep a commandment, that's why I say it. it's like there's a direct thread. It's jerking, kind of, if you want to picture it that way. I do a commandment over here, and it's like the, it jerks over on this other side. So there's something corresponding happening in a spiritual realm. So don't ever settle for trying to explain the inexplicable in the physical realm to someone. Now, do you need some sort of explanation? Sure. But I think, especially for things like kosher laws, we don't completely get why we're supposed. I mean, we get principles. We get the snake and falling down and going on your belly and unclean things and so forth. But see, we can talk all day about those rational explanations, but at its root, it's irrational. Because the roots are in the heavenlies. The roots go up on kosher laws and dietary laws. And so when I keep it in the physical realm, I'm not relying on the health benefits in the physical realm because it won't always make sense. I can fry you know, onions and chicken fat and die of a heart attack. And it'll be kosher. It'd be a kosher heart attack, right? So it's not completely physical. It's rooted in the heavenlies. So I have to understand when I obey these kosher laws, it's an aspect of my faith. It's an expression of my faith. And so we never want to substitute, oh, it's healthy. Oh, they didn't have refrigerators in the wilderness. And I've heard all sorts of crazy stuff to, for people who are trying to 
I'm fine with eating kosher, but they're not fine with my eating kosher. So they're trying to explain it to themselves. And I've heard like, well, you know, it's just because the Israelites didn't have refrigerators. They had to eat like this. And I'm like, beef will go sour just as fast as a pig. You know, chickens are nasty. You can get salmonella from chickens, you know? So really, what's the difference? It's faith. I have to, by faith, differentiate between the things I eat. So this, if we get this, if we get this one thing, we will do and we will hear, and we just settle for, you know what, I will receive layers of understanding as I do the commandments over my lifetime, but I'm not going to try to cop out with a physical, rational explanation when somebody asks me a reason for my faith. The reason for my faith is, I believe God's word, and this is what he wrote, and I know that I won't understand everything till I stand before him and give an account of whether I believed him or not. The end. The end. Now, if I have health benefits on the side, great, but I don't rely on that. I rely on the word. It is written. So here is the first example in the Torah with the Shashelet. And if the first, it's the same verse. You're looking at the same thing. The second example is the verse with the cantillation marks that tells you how to sing it. So if you look over that first word, Vayitmama, you can hear ma, can't you? Like the question, what, what, how, how? Because lot is lingering in that word. It's, it's sustained over a long time. And if you see that kind of little, um, looks like a, maybe a lightning strike. I don't know how else to describe it. I call them things like diamonds and <laughs> um, maybe a right angle or whatever. Um, but you can see the, the mark over Vayit Mama on the second example where the cantillation marks. So when you see that particular cantillation mark, you know that there's going to be a repetition. He's going to draw that syllable out and he's going to repeat the notes three times. He's not going to repeat. He'll do them three times. So it would be repeating it twice. But that's the way that the cantillation marks look. And you can see how they're in addition to the vowel marks. So it's kind of a challenge to read the vowel marks at the same time that you read the cantillation marks. But it's a very efficient use of space, I think. Here's another example. Uh, and this is from Genesis 24, 12. Where is that? Okay, and this mention, this is where Abraham's servant, we assume it's Eleazar, uh, it doesn't say specific, specifically, it just says Abraham's servant, but we assume it was Eleazar of Damascus who stood to inherit Abraham's fortune before the subject of Isaac came up, before Isaac was born. So we know that Abraham was so close to Eleazar that he actually contemplating making him the inheritor of his worldly fortune. Instead, Sarah conceives Isaac. And so I'm sure Eleazar knew that he was a possibility, that he had that close relationship with Abraham that was so close that Abraham would trust him to go find a, an appropriate wife for Isaac. And there could have been a sabotage at this point. Um, you know, if you thought, you know, you'd been working for a billionaire and the billionaire and you were so close that this billionaire didn't have any children, that, well, I may as well bequeath everything to you. But then all of a sudden, now this billionaire, he has a child, and he tasks you with going and finding his son a wife. Would you feel like you had lost something? Well, yeah, billions of dollars or millions, I don't know what, 
Abraham's fortune was worth at that time, but he was a very wealthy man. And the thing is, he never had it. He was still in the status of a servant. But the potential was there. And when you know that you stand in line to inherit something, you start spending that money before you ever get it. <laughs> you start thinking, what would I do with all that money? I would do this. I would do that. If I had this much money, I would do this. So that's the background there on the servant. So in Genesis 24, 12, it's, and he said, Vayomar is that first word, if you, if you can't read the Hebrew, the bold face, it's Vayomar. And he said, Almighty God, the God of my master Abraham, please send me good fortune this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. So the Shashalet is telling us there's a bit of hesitation right here. There's a bit of ambivalence in this prayer. He's saying the right thing, but what is he thinking? I'm guessing he knows that he stood in line to inherit before Isaac came along. Abraham was a rich man. At this point, was he feeling that sense of disinheritance? Like, this is going to seal the deal. I'm going to go find a wife for Isaac. There's no question. Because remember, it says that when we studied that Torah portion, basically it says that Abraham sent all his wealth with Eleazar, with the servant. And you're like, how did he do that? Well, remember the, the sages say it was written on a document. It was written down. So in his hand is the proof of Abraham's wealth. And he's about to hand this over to some girl he's not met yet. And so at this point, if he's human, there's a part of him that's going to say, I don't care who the girl is. Because I've just lost my opportunity to become one of the most wealthy men in the Near East. Instead, he prays a very good prayer. And he doesn't just say, send me good fortune on this journey. He says, show kindness to my master Abraham. And we have to do that sometimes. You know, we have to pray for a result we may not really want. What was the result? he would really want. He would want to be the heir to Abraham. But nevertheless, in spite of his feelings, how he may have felt about that sense of loss, he recognized that there was a greater spiritual reward if he was successful on this mission. He wasn't thinking about Eleazar. He wasn't thinking about me even though the me is feeling the sense of loss, the immediacy, the Esau inside of us feels the immediacy of the loss. I could have had all this, but I'm not going to get it. So we get the Yomar. And he's like, oh, and he said, <laughs> but what is he doing in that pause? He's leaving behind those expectations in view of the greater spiritual reward because the children descended through Isaac and Rebekah are going to be the source of salvation. That's the line of Messiah. That's the salvation of the world, not just Eleazar of Damascus. And so that hesitation, that ambivalence tells you what did he do? I, <laughs> I think it's that old church expression. If you've been to a Pentecostal church, they pray through, right? They just keep praying until they get the answer. With Eleazar, in spite of what he's feeling, he prays on through it and prays for the best results. And it's that spiritual, on the other side of that commandment. And remember also when we read that Torah portion, it said that Eleazar, or the servant, arrived up in Haran in a day. An impossible journey. You can't do that in a day. It was supernatural how he arrived. 
at Rebecca's place. So he's just experienced the supernatural. Just like Lot, he's experiencing the supernatural through the, the agency of the angels. Nevertheless, the physical world has a hold on us. There is such a thing as gravity, right? <laughs> it's still anchoring us in this physical world. And so Lot had to move on through the lingering and escape the destruction. Elazar has to move on through that sense of loss that he may have felt with worldly goods and say, this is for spiritual goods. This is for the future of the world. This is about my heavenly service, not my earthly service. Yes, I serve Abraham, but I also serve the God of Abraham. And, you know, it's even in his prayer. He says, God of my master Abraham, so that it's not to be confused with any other God. The God of my master Abraham, let me be successful. And what does he realize? The physical inheritance he could get from Abraham is finite. It's no good after you die. You leave it here on earth for somebody else to spend. But when you are quick, when you are hasty to execute a commandment, like say Elazar got there in a day. <laughs> when you are quick, when you go with haste, like remember the servant in the parable Yeshua told, the first two servants says immediately they went and invested the talents. They didn't wait. They knew what to do. They didn't, like the other one, I'll bury it and I'll come back later and figure it out. No. They immediately executed. And so he's saying, even though I may feel a sense of loss in this physical world, there's going to be a spiritual reality that I will understand on the other side of success of this commandment. And it's just like the servant. When he gifts us with a few things, and we serve gladly and immediately, sob quickly now, what are we doing? We're investing those gifts in obedience. And we're not looking for the reward today. Because we know the, the reward still can't be seen with the human eye. So we will do and we will hear, which means we will do and later we will understand. We'll see it later. Is a most profound prophetic statement of faith. We will do the commandments according to these detailed instructions we have in the Torah portion. And yes, we will experience levels of understanding in this life, but only when we are gathered into the clouds of glory with Yeshua, with the divine presence, will we actually completely see, like Paul said, right now through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We'll get the depth of what it meant to keep that commandment that may have seemed very minimal to us. You know, I got my candles lit before sundown on Shabbat because I know I'm not supposed to kindle a fire after on Shabbat. It might be a casual thing. It may have just been an instant in time where you process that commandment and said, let me hear it and go ahead and light these candles. but you have no idea what kind of strings it was pulling in heavenly realms. Just that seemingly insignificant act of obedience. How huge that's going to be in the kingdom because he can trust you in a little thing. Something as small as lighting the candles two minutes earlier. <laughs> right? Checking the calendar to make sure you know when sundown is so you can make sure you're not lighting them after Sunday. It's a small thing, but it's huge. On the other side of the veil, it's huge. And that's what Yeshua is teaching us. Sometimes we're going to feel ambivalent. That's part of being human. That's part of being under the force of gravity <laughs> in this physical world. And sometimes, like Abraham's servant, we're going to have to pray through our ambivalence. When we know what to do and we're just like, oh, man, I don't want to do this. What will I be losing by doing that? So sometimes, even before the heart rejoices in the commandment, 
we do it anyway. We obey it anyway, and later the joy will come. Does that make sense? And I think some of the joy will come again with the seeing. In hindsight, you'll be like, I'm so glad I did that because now I understand why I needed to do that. The joy may not be present with those difficult commandments. Nevertheless, we pray through. And what is he praying about? Kindness. Show kindness to Abraham. Even though Abraham just let me know I'm not going to get all his stuff. Show kindness to my master Abraham. This is important. Just like um, the healing of the deaf mute in Mark 9. We have a son here who can't speak and who can't hear. So it's impossible for him to say, I will do and I will hear. You see the symbolism of the healing that Yeshua performs on this boy? Somebody who cannot say, I will do and I will hear, Yeshua heals him. And uh, his disciples tried to cast it out. But notice what the father in Mark 9 calls Yeshua. He calls him teacher, which is a, an important title because Moses was a teacher above all. More than a judge, uh, more than a shepherd, more than all of the roles that he filled, Moses was a teacher. He's called Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher. And so it's significant when Miriam sees Yeshua in the garden, she says, Rabboni, my teacher. Because she sees in Yeshua a role that Moses filled. And so we have the, the deaf and the mute son. The disciples can't cast it out. And uh, it says that they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So Yeshua asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Do you hear kind of an echo of Eleazar's prayer right there? Have kindness on my master Abraham. This father is saying, have compassion on us, help us. And Yeshua said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And I know we've always heard that in the context of a healing service. But it applies to every part of your spiritual life. Do you believe that what you do on this side of the kingdom has a corresponding effect on the other side of the kingdom? You, that's why you keep the commandment. You believe it. That there is some aspect of healing. What is it? I will send my word and heal them. So when you keep a commandment as part of your healing, you say, well, I'm still sick. But you don't know how healthy you're making yourself in spiritual realms. And it says immediately. Do you hear that word immediately again? Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's our pattern. That's the shoshalet. That's what's happening when those who are praying or saying the right thing are still feeling ambivalent. And when Yeshua saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you. Hear that tzav? It's with urgency. It became immediate. Come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Yeshua took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Do you hear that resurrection language in there? We have a healing, and then we have a resurrection. We have an event that's encompassing all these things. The ability, the boy is being healed to be able to say, I will do and I will hear.
And when you say that, what's going to happen? Part of you is going to die. Seriously. When you decide you're going to keep the commandments, there will be a cost. You will pay a price for keeping the commandments. There are friendships you will have to die to. There are religious associations you will have to die to. There might be family members you have to die to for a season. But it's not really death. He's simply creating a place for resurrection. And so you're going to be ambivalent when it comes to some commandments. They're going to be tough. You're not going to be, hey, reading them in a book is easy. Doing them in life is hard. That's why you need a new wineskin. So you can stretch a little and, and deal with the death, the repeated death that keeping the commandment will require of you, that the healing that the word wants to do in you will make it seem like you're dead. And people are going to say, you're dead. You're displeasing to God because you're keeping his commandments. And they don't hear how insane that sounds <laughs> because they don't yet do before they understand. But the Father, he did what we have to do, what Eleazar did, what Lot did, what Joseph did, what Moses did. Even when we're feeling ambivalent, and this father had to feel that way, he has a child who is not only deaf and mute, he's demon-possessed since this boy's childhood. When you live with an invalid child that long, with a disabled child that long, do you see how your faith might be a little shaky? Because the reality is with you, not every day, it's every ticking second of the day. You don't know what this child is going to do. If you turn your back for a second, he might be in the oven. You turn your back for a second, he might be in the well. You turn your back for a second, he might be having a convulsion. Can you imagine how hard it was for that father to say, I believe? Even though inside of him, he's saying, how can I believe it when my living reality is this? But you know what? He, he did the pattern. Immediately he cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm praying a prayer that I don't 100% believe, but I really believe it anyway. My soul, you know, it's like the earth is a magnet to my soul and it's pulling me down into unbelief, but my spirit wants to believe you. So help that part of me that's rooted in disbelief, rooted in the physical realm. And I almost think if, if the New Testament had been written with cancellation marks, what that father said when he cried out and said, Lord, I believe, I believe it would have been written with a shashavet cancellation mark. Because he's expressing what's happening. Forgive my unbelief. Forgive my lack of joy. Sometimes we keep a commandment. We say, where's my joy? I'm supposed to be having fun at Sukkot, and it seems like just disaster after disaster. And you know what you say? Lord, I believe. I'm happy, and forgive my unbelief. <laughs> at the very same time, we, we're all going to struggle with that ambivalence, and the Torah portion gives us the pattern for working through it, and this Father follows the pattern. I'm going to pray for the best result. We can go to, let me see. Here's the third one in Genesis, Genesis 39, 8. And this is where uh, Joseph is tempted by Potiphar's wife. It says, but Yosef refused. And that's that first word in bold right there. Uh, and it actually almost sounds like Amen, but it's uh, Vayeh Ma'en. 
Yeh Ma'en. And that's going to be the word that is sustained with the Shashalet. If, if I had the cancellation marks up there, you could see that that's the one that's sustained. So Joseph is refusing, but is part of him attracted to her? He's a, he's a kid. He's at the height of his sexual, you know, whatever. And so here's a woman who's all painted up. And he's saying the right things. He's absolutely saying the right things. But in his refusal, we hear ambivalence. I know I can't do this, but part of me wants to. So he's doing the right thing. In spite of his ambivalence, he says the right things. He gives the right answer and he runs away. So there's the pattern. Um, you know, Joseph Saul had to have been tempted. Any young man would be tempted. And yet Joseph is acknowledging the great responsibility that's been put on him. The great gift. Remember the, the talent parable? Look how many talents. Even though he's a slave, look how many responsibilities he's been given by the master who's not there. A very similar parable to this situation. But when he refuses, it tells us, ah, uh, I'm refusing, but there's a part of me that really wants to. But that's the pattern. So as disciples of Yeshua, we can't deny that sometimes we're ambivalent about the commandments. And don't feel rotten about yourself if you do. Just pray through. Say through. That's what Joseph did. He said through. He just started quoting, rattling off, his responsibility, not just to his master, but, you know, thinking about his father, what his father has taught him, matching what he's being tempted to do against what he knows the standard is. And so, basically, we get more of the same thing. What Joseph is saying is, I'm tempted with this physical gratification right now, I'm tempted with probably more luxury right now. I'm sure she would have rewarded him richly. Um, I know I could have more comfort right now. I know maybe I could earn more social standing right now. I know I could be safer now. We've got this long list of reasons why we feel ambivalent about keeping the commandment. Because in the end, we feel like we're forfeiting something that we really never have. You get the deceit there? Lot is lingering over Sodom. He thinks there's something there that's good for him. It's not. We know that in hindsight. He didn't figure it out in the middle of the situation. Look at Joseph. Look at all the things he could have had had he slept with Potiphar's wife. But would he have really had them. No. It's a deceit. All the comfort, all the social standing, all the luxury, all the safety, all the physical gratification, whatever your soul tells you that you're going to enjoy right now, it's an illusion. It's a deceit. You're being asked to exchange something valuable, your obedience, your fidelity, Basically, for a pot of lentils, you're going to eat it, and you're going to poop it out. That's what this physical life is like. I've never understood people that will drink a, a six-pack of beer. You know where that's going to be in about an hour? And look how much money it costs for something that goes straight through you. Well, to me, a lot of this... Avoiding the commandments or breaking the commandments, it's like drinking a six-pack of beer. It costs you a lot in the long run, and you got nothing to show for it. It's not healthy. It has potential for addiction. It has potential for DUI. There's a long list of potential bad things that can happen. 
you have a potential for your children imprinting on that behavior and maybe a way they're not able to handle. And so your freedom has become a stumbling block and there's nothing to show for it. Nothing. If you had something to show for it, but you're going to have nothing at the end of the day, just a higher water bill. And that's, that's the way we can think of this. When we get stuck in ambivalence, say, what have I got to have to show for this really? If I achieved, you know, going down there to Mar-a-Lago and to Trump land, those houses in that neighborhood are $56 million. You know how many lifetimes I would have to live to make $56 million? But the real question is, at the end of their lives, will that be their value in the kingdom? Or will it have been like a six pack of beer? At the end of days, it was beautiful, but when my life is over, I've really got nothing to show for it. And so that brings us back to, you know, songs of deliverance. The Torah is a song. The angels came to, de to deliver Lot. Elazar was sent on a mission of deliverance. He knew that Isaac needed a wife, but he didn't need a Canaanite wife. And if he was going to be an instrument of deliverance for Israel, then he needed good success. It's the same thing with Joseph. It doesn't look like he was delivered out of his situation at that moment. But nevertheless, he sang the truth. Because if we listen to that passage in Hebrew, we would be listening to him sing a song to Potiphar's wife, a song of deliverance. Because he gave up sexual gratification today for a greater deliverance later. And that's what we're doing. When we become ambivalent about the commitment, remind yourself that this is my opportunity, even if I'm ambivalent, it's my opportunity to sing a song of deliverance from the Torah. And so it says in Deuteronomy 33, 4 through 5, Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Yeshurun when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. Now, sometimes we can debate who the king actually was. Is it referring, is the antecedent Moses? It appears to be. We could also say the king was Adonai himself. But let's just take the simple context. Moses, when he slaughtered that ram for Aaron, he was passing the priesthood to his brother. He had forfeited the priesthood at the burning bush by being reluctant, by being ambivalent and lingering too long until finally the Holy One says, fine, Aaron's got zeal for this. I'll send Aaron and he'll speak for you. And so Moses became the lawgiver. Moses became the teacher. Moses became the miracle worker but he would not have the priesthood, nor would his sons. And I, because we know Moses was not jealous. When the, the men are prophesying in the camp and Joshua says, oh no, they're all prophesying. He says, that's great. I wish they would all prophesy. He's not territorial. He intercedes for Aaron to preserve him, even though Aaron led them to the golden calf. He intercedes and the priesthood is preserved for his brother. So he's not jealous of his brother. What's going on with Moses? Why does he hesitate when he slaughters that ram? Well, I think it probably goes back, and here's the verse in Leviticus 8.23. Vayishchat. Vayishchat. Shechita is ritual slaughter. Vayishchat. That is going to be the shalshelet, syllable. It's going to center on why is Moses ambivalent 
about slaughtering this ram to consecrate Aaron and his sons into the priesthood. Because I think probably at that moment he realizes how his ambivalence at the burning bush has now affected his own sons, who will not be priests. His sons will be Levites, not priests. At that moment, he could have been slaughtering the ram to consecrate his own sons into the priesthood, but they would never have that. They would be Levites, but never priests. Nevertheless, let me stop this share here, see if I can play it for you. I want you to hear how it sounds. I want you to hear maybe even the sadness of a father when he realizes his actions have affected his children. That was one word. Did you hear how long he sustained it and the repetition of that last syllable with the shalshelet? I'm going to play it again and then compare it to the rest of the verse, how fast it goes. One word. Now listen to the rest of it. So, we have this sustaining of the slaughter. There's ambivalence. Moses realized that because of his ambivalence, when that window was open, that his children are not going to have that great high role of the priesthood. There will never be a high priest that can descend from him. And so we get his hesitation. We get his ambivalence. It's not for himself. I think it has to be because who is he consecrating? Not just Aaron. Aaron's four sons. Those could have been his sons. But instead, it's going to be Aaron's son. So what did Aaron have that Moses didn't max out on? Zeal. Zeal for the job. Now, they're both descended from Levi, who had a lot of zeal, right? But... I think Moses' mother probably contributed some things that uh, slowed down, in some senses, that zeal. But remember, Moses grew up as a prince. Moses grew up as royalty. He grew up in the house of a king, basically, a pharaoh. So Moses has an attribute of royalty, a prince. He also has an attribute of the priesthood, descended from Levi. He also has the attributes of a shepherd, a teacher. So what does Aaron have? He has a lot of zeal and he has a lot of compassion. But that zeal and that compassion led him straight to a golden calf. And out of the four sons, we have a 50% attrition rate. Remember Nadav and Avihu? They offered the strange fire. They rushed ahead of their father in their zeal. And they ended up, you know, the crispy critters. They died before Adonai. They died doing something that was actually a commandment, but it was out of time and out of place. 
it was strange fire. So zeal is a wonderful thing, but it has a high attrition rate. Later that zeal, like with Pinchas, when he takes up the spear and he spears through the adulterer and his partner, that's godly zeal. When it's godly zeal, when it's in order, then we got a good thing going on. But it's like with our political system, ideally with our political system, there's checks and balances. In this system of scripture, there's also checks and balances. We have a priesthood, which it's probably good that the descendants of Levi did receive the priesthood because they were really in the slaughter. So rather than have them slaughtering human beings, we have them slaughtering animals in the Mishkan, in the temple. We can take that zeal and aim it in a positive direction. But Moses became known not as the high priest, even though he did function in priestly capacities. We'll notice, especially that six days leading up to the final day of consecration for Aaron, he's actually performing the priestly duties at that time. So he's got a little bit of priestly in him. He's a, he's a lady. But it says he commanded a law for us. And it says he was king. And Yeshua. So we get the sense of royalty out of Moshe, nobility. We know that he was a judge. We know that he was a prophet. And so in Moses, I think we see balance. We can see how these roles are working together. Um, without jealousy, Remember the call of the angels, holy, holy, holy? The tongues of angels are, are things that are spoken to one another, especially in worship, without jealousy for the role that someone else is filling. In fact, it's being glad. You know, if, if Moses hadn't loved his brother very much, when he came down the mountain and saw what Aaron had done with the golden cap, that was his opportunity to get rid of him. But no, without any ambivalence at all, he intercedes, not just for Aaron, but for the whole people. He says, if you're going to blot them out of your book, blot me out. So he's got that, that, that lady, that interceder in him, but he also had the tablets of the law in his hands at the very same time. Um, but I think in this moment, where he's going to slaughter this ram on behalf of Aaron and his sons, he had to look back in hindsight. And even though his role was for the higher good, because he brought balance to the system, Sometimes you look in hindsight and say, I could have had this. I could have done that. If I had just done this at that time, if I'd just done that at that time. It's okay to be ambivalent, to take that pause. But at the very same time, you recognize what could have been. The commandment is to tzav. Execute. Do what you know to do. Now. That's what it means. Do it now. It's not a vaikra. It's not a call. It's a direct command. No matter what is going through your head, if you know what to do, and you know how to do it, then you have to solve and execute it later and maybe only after the resurrection will you understand why what you thought was a forfeiting of something good actually turned out to be a blessing for you and your children 
Because if you think of Moses' children, we don't hear much of them. And that's a good thing in the wilderness. Because you remember what his cousin Korach did? Why is Korach famous? Troublemaking. Jealousy. Covetousness. Slander. Moses' sons weren't involved in those sorts of Levitical intrigues. They had a they had a good name by not having a bad name. <laughs> we remember the bad ones, right? They're never going to be counted among the evil kings of Israel. And there's more evil ones than there are good ones. So yes, Moses was king in Israel of a type. He was a priest in Israel of a type. But his descendants would never be associated with the wickedness of royalty or with the wickedness of the priesthood because there's, there's a greater consequence when you have those highly, you know, when you get that five talents instead of one, you got to produce five talents worth of effort and five talents worth of righteousness, and five talents worth of immediacy in the execution of the commandment. You're expected to come up with five talents worth of results. And so for Moses, what did his children inherit from him? Probably a little bit of everything. A little bit of a Levite's heart, a little bit of nobility, wisdom and judgment. And so sometimes it's better not to have the highest position because that's a heavy burden to bear. And one little mistake, like Nadav and Avihu, and then you're not a priest anymore. <laughs> you're dead. <laughs> you know, and you, you've got to give that accounting. And so... I think with us, when we reach those places of ambivalence, or even in reflection, I think Moses is in a reflection mode where it draws out that note over the slaughter. He's looking at Aaron's sons and thinking, that could have been my sons. Don't think like that. Even when you do, and you will, you will think of what you lost. When you think of your history, there will be something that provokes it. There will be something that brings it to mind. What could I have been? What could my children and grandchildren have been if I had just done this one thing different? You're going to think like that, but don't think like that. So what, what am I saying? Do or don't. It's not a matter of do or don't. It's you will, but pray through. I believe that everything that has happened to me will be for the good, not just for me, for my children, for my grandchildren, for my descendants after me. Whatever has gone on in my life, if it's something horrible and I've repented, you've turned it into something sweet. And they will benefit from that. And so, yes, I might have those moments of regret, and I wish I had never done that. But just say, forgive my unbelief. I know, well, Uzi, <laughs> excuse us, <laughs> wow, uh, no matter what, he's going to take that thing and what it's going to produce, the fruit it's going to produce in time, we'll be able, when we get on that other side of the veil, we can look back and say that was precisely what needed to happen to gain this result. That woke you up, didn't it? <laughs> so I hope that helps you a little bit with, um, or makes you at least curious about listening to the Torah as a song. And maybe about pulling up, and I'll put the link on there if you want to look it up. Um, all you need is your birth date, and you need to know whether you were born in Israel or not. And you, you key that information 
into the, the website, and there's lots of them. It's not just this one. And it'll pull up your portion in the Torah. Mine's Mishpatim. I, you can find out what yours is. And then you can click, and it will take you and allow you to listen to the song of your portion. And you say, well, I don't understand what they're saying. They're, they're singing in Hebrew. It's okay. Your spirit knows what they're saying. You just got to believe. With your, with your human physical understanding, you don't understand what they're saying. You're having to rely on the English. But with your spiritual understanding, you speak Hebrew. You do Hebrew. And you hear Hebrew. And you can speak with the tongues of men and angels.